Now that we've taken a look at the graphs of lines and planes in 3D, we're ready to extend that conversation as we ask, how do we graph other shapes or other curves or surfaces in space? And we're going to start with kind of the basic graph, and that is going to be the graph of a cylinder. And a cylinder in three space graphing is not what we think of with a normal cylinder. Normally, we think of a cylinder like a soup can. But actually, a cylinder is going to be defined here as any 3D shape made of parallel curves. And the most basic form of that, and there are others, but the most basic form of that is when one variable is missing from the equation. What we'll do in that case is we will graph in the other planes and copy down the missing variable. In other words, if x is missing, we'll graph it in two dimensions on the yz plane. And then we'll copy that yz graph all the way up and down the x graph. Let's take a look at some examples so we can see that happen. First graph we're going to do is z equals x cubed. First thing I'll observe with z equals x cubed is that the y variable is missing. So if the y variable is missing, we're going to graph it on the xz plane. So we'll graph it two-dimensionally, but we'll graph it on xz. And we know that the graph of anything cubed is going to be this graph that comes up from the negative, levels off at 0, and then kind of takes off after that. That graph on the, XY pl on the xz plane, then, is going to be copied down the y-axis. So now we try and transition that two-dimensional graph into a three-dimensional graph where we've got x, y, and z. And we've already graphed on the x, z plane. Let's go ahead and draw the negatives also on this coordinate system so we can kind of see in three dimensions there. So the x, z plane, we've already got this graph that comes up on the x, z levels off, and then takes off, where kind of y is 0. But that same graph is going to be able to slide up and down the y-axis. And so we'll see it levels off at 0 and takes off, or back down the y-axis, where it comes up, levels off, and takes off. And so what we end up with is this kind of three-dimensional sheet with a little bit of a curve to it, maybe emphasize that the peaks and the valleys line up here. This three-dimensional sheep, it's a cylinder of all of these parallel graphs, these parallel lines made of, y, of z equals x cubed all the way up and down the line. Let's take a look at another example. Let's graph z equals y squared. Because we just have z and y, we're going to graph it on the yz plane. So we'll start with our two-dimensional graph so we know what that looks like on the yz plane. And we know that the squared variable gives us that parabola graph. And so we're going to copy that graph down the other variable, down the x-axis. 
So let's see if we can do that. We've got x, y, and z. Let's include the negatives, even though we don't really need them in this graph. What do we do on the x? And now with the z, y plane, that's almost the actual two-dimensional plane that we're used to here. The z, y plane is this parabola. And that parabola is going to go all the way down the x-axis and all the way down the x-axis the other direction. And so you can see we kind of end up with this three-dimensional curve. It's a parabola going all the way down the x-axis. And this then becomes our three-dimensional graph of z equals y squared. Now, this idea of graphing a two-dimensional version of the graph and then seeing how it stretches along the graph, there's actually a name for that two-dimensional version for the graph. So let's go ahead and formally define that here. We call it a trace or a cross-section that is created when a surface intersects a plane parallel to a coordinate plane. We've been focusing thus far when one of the variables is 0. So we've got the either the xy plane, the yz plane, or maybe the xz plane. We're on that center point. But it doesn't have to be on that center point. It could be anywhere. So let's say we've got you know, your typical cosine graph. And let's see if I can make it 3D by drawing another cosine graph back here. There's your three-dimensional graph. It's a cylinder because it's that same graph stretched all the way through. And the idea is if we were to cut it in the middle, what you end up with is a nice little cosine graph cut in the middle. It's that two-dimensional representation when it's sliced down. It, and then that two-dimensional is stretched throughout the rest of the graph to give you the 3D version of it. These traces become very helpful when we try to graph other shapes that aren't just this cylinder shape that stretches throughout the whole graph, but it changes as you go through the graph. We talked about lines and planes. The next level up, lines and planes are made with x, y, and z. The next level up are made with x squared, y squared, and z squared. These graphs are called quartic surfaces. And now, in general, a quartic surface is of the form ax squared plus by squared plus z. I'm sorry, cz squared. And then we've also got combinations of the x's and y's. So we've got uh, dxy plus eyz plus fxz. And then we've got x's and y's that could appear by themselves. gx plus hy plus, we have to skip i because that's the square root of negative 1. So we'll jump to jz. Or there's also possibly having a constant k equal to 0. Some combination of x squared, y squared, z squared, x, y's, and z's, combinations thereof. We call those the quartic surfaces. This is the three-dimensional version of our parabolas, ellipses, hyperbolas, circles, the conic sections, now in 3D. Let's look at trying to graph one of these quartic surfaces. Let's try and sketch x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 plus z squared over 25 equals 1. 
One thing you might notice is this kind of has the feel of an ellipse. But we're going to see if the traces can confirm that suspicion. What we can do with traces is we're going to take a trace in each direction. First, we're going to do a trace on the xy plane, which means we don't want any z's. We can make z equal to any convenient number we want. The easiest one's probably going to be 0. If that didn't work, we'd have to pick another number. If sometimes if z is 0, everything goes to 0 and it's useless to us. But in this case, it doesn't. We end up with x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 plus 0 equals 1. And we recognize this graph as an ellipse on the xy plane. Um, in the x direction, we're going to go 2 each direction. In the y direction, it goes 3 each direction. And so we end up with this nice little ellipse in the xy direction. We need to know what's happening in all the directions. So we're also going to draw a trace in the xz direction. When we do this, y is equal to 0. So we end up with x squared over 4 plus z squared over 25 equals 1. All right, in the xz direction, the x is, because the denominator is 4, the square root is 2 each direction. The z's go this, each direction 5 units. And so on this xz graph, we end up with this tall, skinny ellipse. And I'm not going to quite fit it all on one screen. But we do need to also do a trace in the yz direction, which means our x is equal to 0. When x is equal to 0, the equation becomes y squared over 9 plus z squared over 25 equals 1. And so if we were to try and draw that, We end up with the y's. We've got our y, z axis. The y's are going 3 each direction, so it's a little wider than the green one. The z's still going 5 each direction. And we end up with this slightly fatter ellipse. And now what we're going to try and do is put these three graphs together in one. What we see is in the yz direction, we get a fat, tall ellipse. In the xz direction, it's a skinnier ellipse. In the xy direction, it's really a small ellipse. And so when we put it all together, into a 3D graph, what we end up with is the short, skinny one, one direction, tall and skinny another direction, and fatter and skinnier, fatter and a little wider the other direction. We end up with this three-dimensional, what we call an ellipsoid. That's how we can use the surfaces to kind of combine them each together to end up with our three-dimensional ellipsoid. What I've done here is I've drawn on a ca online calculator the 3D ellipsoid. And what you can see is if we look at the top, we see that ellipse that goes from 2 to 3. If I look from one side, we see the ellipse that goes from 
2 to negative 2 one direction and 5 to negative 5 another direction. And if we look at the other side, we see the slightly fatter 3 to negative 3 and 5 to negative 5. And this 3D shape is our ellipsoid we've been trying to draw. Now, there are some common quartic surfaces that we're going to work to get familiar with in this section. And your book has a really nice introduction to them on page 221 through 222. And so I want to hop over to a picture from the book of those shapes, just so that we can talk about some characteristics really quick about each of these. We've already talked about the ellipsoid. The ellipsoid is similar to the ellipse. We've got an x squared over something plus y squared over something plus a z squared over something. What really makes an ellipsoid defined is you notice that x squared, y squared, and z squared are all positive. And they're not going to equal 0. They're going to equal a number. That's going to create the ellipsoid. And if a, b, and c all are equal, we actually end up with a perfect sphere because all of those major and minor axes are going to be equivalent. And just like we saw before, uh, the traces were all ellipses in the various directions. Now, if we make a minor change and we make one of them negative, so we've got a positive, a positive, and you see that we've got that negative z squared. If one of them is negative, we end up with what's called a hyperboloid of one sheet. So with two of the variables positive coefficient, one with a negative coefficient. And then the way we know which direction this hyperboloid is pointing is that the axis corresponds with the negative coefficient. So in this case, the z squared was negative. And so you see the graph here goes around the z axis. If the y squared was the negative one, it would turn sideways and go around the y axis. Now, if two of the terms are negative, here we've got two variables with negative coefficients and one with a positive coefficient, a positive, a negative, and a negative. We end up with what's called a hyperboloid of two sheets. The hyperbola with two sheets doesn't connect in the middle. And what we also notice is that the axis of the surface corresponds to the variable with a positive coefficient. So here, the z squared was positive, and that's why it goes around the z axis. If the y squared was positive, it would go around the y axis. If the x squared was positive, it would go around the x axis. Now, each of these have been equal to a number, but sometimes our equations are equal to 0, which changes things slightly. One example here is the elliptical cone. With the elliptical cone, we've got two positives and one negative, but this time it equals 0. If it equals 0, then the axis of the surface will correspond to the variable with the negative coefficient. So again, here the z is negative. That's why the cone goes around the z axis. We end up with an elliptical paraboloid if we have a constant term, z. And the x and y terms are each squared. That constant term is called the linear term. And the axis will correspond with the linear variable, which is why this graph goes around the z axis. Finally, the last one we're going to look at for our purposes is the hyperbolic paraboloid. The hyperbolic paraboloid is really interesting because in one plane, you have a hyperbola. In the other planes, you have parabolas. And the way we get that, very similar to our last example, except we've got the middle term is negative. Or there's a negative in between the x squared and y squared, still equal to a linear term. And that linear term that it's equal to is going to be the axis of the surface that it's all built around. Also interesting is it's going to wrap around the positive 
variable. So these six shapes, you can see them in your book. It also lists all the traces that you're going to get from each of these x, y, z directions. There's going to be some problems on the assignment where it's going to ask you to identify what shape you're dealing with. And the way we can do that is by paying attention to what's positive, what's negative, and what does it equal. So let's see if those are our common quadratic surfaces. Let's see if we can identify some quartic surfaces. Let's say we're given the surface 16x squared plus 9y squared plus 16z squared equals 144. What I would notice on here is looking at the squared terms, x squared, y squared, and z squared, all the squares are positive. We've got a positive 16x squared, a positive 9y squared, a positive 16y squared. It also does not equal 0. So if I were to go through and divide the whole thing by 144, it would be equal to 1, which is exactly the form of the ellipsoid. Let's take a look and see what this graph looks like in the 3D graphing calculator. So here's our 3D graph, just as we expected. It's an ellipsoid. All the traces are ellipses, just like we predicted. So we're doing good on that one. Let's try another example. Let's see if we can identify the shape of 9x squared minus 18x plus 4y squared plus 16y minus 36z plus 25 equals 0. Well, what are we going to note about this shape? I do see that there's an x and a y term, but those could be paired with the x squared and the y squared. And through a process of completing the square, we could make that x or y plus or minus some number, the whole thing squared. So those kind of come in groups. But I do notice that the z is a linear term. So we have x squared and y squared are positive. And the z is linear. Going back to our graph, we saw x squared and y squared positive and the z linear with the elliptic paraboloid. And it could be either variable linear. What we have is two squared variables and one linear variable. And the linear variable is going to tell us which axis this graph is going to wrap around. So we end up with an elliptic paraboloid here. And if we go to the graphing calculator, let's see if our guess was correct. And here is our shape graphed. What you see is it does have that bowl shape that we were expecting from the elliptic paraboloid. It's an ellipse from one angle and a parabola from the two other angles. We have an elliptic paraboloid. Let's do one last example of identifying our shape. We're going to do 9x squared plus y squared minus z squared plus 2z minus 10 equals 0. And let's see what we can note about this shape. Again, we've got a z linear term, but it can be paired with the z squared through a process of completing the squared. So we have x squared and y squared are positive. But you notice that z squared is negative. So we have two positive squares and one negative square. And that plus 10 can bump to the other side. So it's not going to actually be equal to 0.
Which one did that? Two positive squares and one negative squared. That's going to be a hyperboloid of one sheet. It is a hyperboloid of one sheet. Let's look at this example on the graphing calculator. Here's our hyperboloid of one sheet on the graphing calculator. You notice one direction, it's a hyperbola. Other direction, it's an ellipse. And the other direction, it's a skinnier hyperbola. We've got our hyperboloid of one sheet, because it's going to go through the origin. The hyperbolas, hyperbolas connect in the middle. If we had two negatives, then they wouldn't connect in the middle. But it is hollow in the center. So today, that's what we're taking a look at, three-dimensional shapes, whether they're cylinders or quartic surfaces. Hopefully, you can get some familiarity with the different shapes as you work through the homework assignment. And in class, we'll discuss them further and answer any questions that you may have.